here with Dr. Rachel Tambling from the University of Connecticut. She's an assistant, uh, University of Connecticut. She's an assistant professor of uh, marriage and family therapy. Uh, Rachel's a graduate of the uh, University of Georgia. I was interested in uh, talking more uh, to you, Rachel, today about your research with uh, outcomes uh, in uh, uh, clinical outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about what uh, what you're doing right now with uh, with your research. Sure, I'm really interested in little O outcomes because little O outcomes get you to big O outcome. Okay. So little O's are things like um, successful engagement in therapy, mm -hmm. uh, the formation of a positive alliance, basically continuance in therapy, choosing to stick around in therapy, to persist in therapy, and to choose to engage in the tasks of therapy because those are the mechanisms by which you get to behavior change and positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. And we know from past literature that if we're going to have significant problems with dropout, that usually happens within the first four sessions. You know, we have failures to engage really early on in therapy, and I'm interested in how do we understand that phenomenon a little bit better so that we can do more as therapists and as trainers of therapists to help clients engage and persist in therapy. Okay, so this is um, <clears throat> what people have referred to as process research. How would you say that? Yeah, yeah some, of, <clears throat> some of this entails process research because uh, therapy is really like the black box on an airplane. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of stuff goes in, and unless something bad happens, we don't really know what that stuff was, mm -hmm. right? And so we really understand very little about what happens in therapy sessions that subsequently leads to successful therapy. Mm -hmm. And so some of the research that I'm engaged in is looking at the way that people use language and talking early in therapy. And the critical question that I want to answer is what do people talk about in therapy? Mm -hmm. And how is the, the way that they talk about the things that they talk about related to these things like therapy persistence and therapy continuance? So for example, an interesting question is um, to whom are questions directed mm -hmm. in therapy? And does that have any bearing on these little O outcomes? What do people talk about? I think there's an assumption made that we talk a lot about presenting problems, particularly in the early sessions of therapy, but we don't really know. How are presenting problems talked about? Is it question and answer? Is there more interaction? You know, we, I think, have this collective understanding of what happens in early therapy sessions that we don't know if that's accurate, if that really matches up with what actually happens. And then how are those things related to little O outcomes and yeah. big O outcomes. Can you talk a little bit about how theory drives this kind of research, or is this more investigative uh, inquiry? It's more investigative inquiry, but I think we have a dominant theory of systems theory that says yeah. that we should be interacting with people and that it should be the therapist's responsibility to understand the system and to join with the system and to make systemic inquiries about what's occurring and I don't know what the therapists do mm -hmm. and so I think that's a really interesting question to ask and it kind of gets at the aspects of um, how much does theoretical orientation matter are there aspects of the way that talk happens in the early sessions of therapy that are atheoretical or are they more theoretically driven mm -hmm. you know we don't know um, so I think that's an interesting question that links it back to theory I'm really interested in little o outcomes because little o outcomes get you to big O outcome. Okay. So little O's are things like um, successful engagement in therapy, mm -hmm. uh, the formation of a positive alliance, basically continuance in therapy, choosing to stick around in therapy, to persist in therapy, and to choose to engage in the tasks of therapy because those are the mechanisms by which you get to behavior change and positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. And we know from past literature that if we're going to have significant problems with dropout that usually happens within the first four sessions. You know, we have failures to engage really early on in therapy and I'm interested in how do we understand that phenomenon a little bit better so that we can do more as therapists and as trainers of therapists to help clients engage and persist in therapy. Okay, so this is um, <clears throat> what people have referred to as process research. How would you say that? Yeah, yeah some, of, <clears throat> some of this entails process research because uh, therapy is really like the black box on an airplane. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of stuff goes in, and unless something bad happens, we don't really know what that stuff was, mm -hmm. right? And so we really understand very little about what happens in therapy sessions that subsequently leads to successful therapy. Mm -hmm. And so some of the research that I'm engaged in is looking at the way that people use language and talking early in therapy. 
And the critical question that I want to answer is what do people talk about in therapy? And how is the, the way that they talk about the things that they talk about related to these things like therapy persistence and therapy continuance? So for example, an interesting question is um, to whom are questions directed mm -hmm. in therapy? And does that have any bearing on these little O outcomes? What do people talk about? I think there's an assumption made that we talk a lot about presenting problems, particularly in the early sessions of therapy, but we don't really know. How are presenting problems talked about? Is it question and answer? Is there more interaction? You know, we, I think, have this collective understanding of what happens in early therapy sessions that we don't know if that's accurate, if that really matches up with what actually happens. And then how are those things related to little O outcomes and yeah. big O outcomes? Can you talk a little bit about how theory drives this kind of research, or is this more in investigative uh, inquiry? It's more investigative inquiry, but I think we have a dominant theory of systems theory that says that we should be interacting with people and that it should be the therapist's responsibility to understand the system and to join with the system and to make systemic inquiries about what's occurring. And I don't know what the therapists do. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really interesting question to ask. And it kind of gets at the aspects of... Um, how much does theoretical orientation matter? Are there aspects of the way that talk happens in the early sessions of therapy that are atheoretical or are they more theoretically driven? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know. Um, so I think that's an interesting question that links it back to theory. So Sean Davis in this series of interviews talks about common factors research. Mm -hmm. And would you classify what you do in, in this area, uh, this process research, as common factors research? I think it, it, I would classify myself as a moderate common factors person. Okay. I think that the models tell us how to enact the common factors. Um, and so I have a, a little bit more model-y than true common factors. Okay. I'm hopeful that this research, though, will eventually lead us to an understanding not only of common factors, but a little bit better of models. So, for example, um, I think one of the critical questions is what type of questions do we ask clients? Mm -hmm. Questioning itself, that inquisitive nature is a common factor, being interested in clients and that. But is there a way that questions are asked that is more engaging to clients than another way? So as a strategic therapist, if I ask about problems, is that more engaging? Or is it more engaging to explore exceptions to problems like someone from another tradition might do. It's observational research. We have a video archive um, right now, I, hundreds of sessions, we have two terabytes of mm -hmm. data. And so we have pulled uh, first sessions of couples in our coding, uh, just the grammatical function of the talk that occurs in the sessions. And right now we're working on the sequential analysis of that. So looking at if I, therapist, ask a question, who am I asking that question to? Who answers the questions and how does that happen sequentially over time? Our next step will be to do the content analysis of that and to figure out what is being said in particular grammatical types of exchanges. So the, the content analysis is more of a, uh, a qualitative yes. line of inquiry? So you're kind of really, this is going to be a mixed methods approach as right. well. Right. I'm in a super hybrid approach here because we have some sequential analysis, which is very quantitative yeah. research. We have some observational coding, um, traditional process research, and then a qualitative piece. So it's really mixed methods, probably as mixed as you could get. I'm really interested in what's, what's the mechanism by which people choose to persist and maintain themselves in therapy. What's the mechanism by which that happens? We can understand a lot of things about moderation and mediation and predictors of successful engagement and retention in therapy, but those don't really get at this key question of what is the mechanism by which that happens, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's some of what got me thinking in this direction is some um, Kasdan research that looks at the difference between mediation, moderation, and mechanism. And that's what I'm interested in, is what's the mechanism? So we know that alliance contributes to outcome. What's the mechanism by which a positive alliance is formed? Yeah. So Surely at some point you talk about the goals, so and that's have, a mechanism. Do you have a sense as to what that is? I mean, do you have a, you know, kind of a hypothesis that you're working from that I think we're going to end up finding this? Or? I sure hope it's the, it's the way that we talk to people, that we offer a unique uh, frame of reference for the world, because that's 
why I do this. Like that gets back to you systems thinking. If systems thinking really matters, then the way that we talk to people, the words that we choose to use matter. For those uh, who are watching who are thinking about the next line of inquiry into what you're doing, what are some of the big questions that are still out there? Gosh, I'm, my research I always think of is in an area where we know really nothing. We know very little. So in addition to this research, I've done work in the area of expectations, expectation management, expectation induction, um, motivation to change, some of those things that we have conventional wisdom and research says that they matter. But we don't understand why they matter or how they matter. Um, positive expectations of outcome contribute to successful outcomes, which is probably a Pygmalion effect. If you expect it, you get it. But we don't understand the mechanism by which Pygmalion effect happens. Mm -hmm. So they discovered the Pygmalion effect in classrooms like 55 years ago. Mm -hmm. But we still don't understand the mechanism by which that happens, and it happens in every field. It happens in medicine, and it happens in tennis. I read an interesting article about yeah. that. We don't understand how. Mm -hmm. So motivation to change impacts persistence. Why? How? What is it about more motivated people that happens within sessions that contributes to their persisting in sessions? What is it about people who have positive expectations that they do in session with their therapist that contributes to persistence? What is it about the way that we talk to people that contributes to persistence? Because something has to happen in session that we don't fully understand. So what if... What if what is happening in session is not that important. I mean, I, I've, I've That often would be great, thought, too. Yeah, I've often <laughs> thought that, that, you know, like, like some of the successes of my clients are because you get you take two very busy people who clear yes. their calendars. To they spend write, time on their relationship. They, they, they spend mm -hmm. time, they're intentional, they write a check, you know, they're, yeah. and they walk away from that. Maybe it's a dissonance theory. Well, we're doing so much for our relationship, I think we're getting better. I think we're know? getting better. I think that would be a great thing. And I actually have another study going on right now with some colleagues called the Daily Diary Study, where mm. we had couples um, who were participating in therapy every day fill out a questionnaire, um, a diary questionnaire about was there anything in ther that they talked about in therapy that they did? Was there anything that they did just because they thought about it? Was there anything that was suggested in therapy that they decided not to do? And then what did they think for that day were the things that impacted the quality of their relationship? Mm -hmm. To try to get at some of that sort of thing. And maybe the way we talk to people doesn't matter, but surely there's some mechanism by which people stay in therapy that we don't understand. Yeah. People don't just hang around because it's fun. It's painful. It's a painful process for many people. It's an expensive process. Why do people hang around? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, things for us to think about as we mm -hmm. go forward.